Abbey Road, published on September 26, 1969, was the final Beatles album recorded, but not the last to be released. Despite being primarily recorded in January 1969, Let It Be was finally released in May 1970 alongside the film of the same name. In the spring of 1969, Paul McCartney called George Martin. He asked if he would be prepared to collaborate with the Beatles on a new album they were planning to record in the coming months. Martin, widely regarded as the world's most accomplished pop record producer, had overseen the creation of all nine albums and 19 singles that the Beatles had released in the United Kingdom since their debut on EMI's Parlophone label in 1962. How excited are you to learn more about this adventure? Stay tuned because we're going to speak more about our British boys today and how they conquered pop music worldwide. So let's take a look look at the 50th anniversary of Abbey Road and how the Beatles shared the experience with their fans, please subscribe to our YouTube channel before we begin. So when George Martin received the call from McCartney, his first thoughts were, I believed it was the end of the road for all of us after Get Back. Martin stated, I didn't want to work with them anymore since they were becoming awful people, both to themselves and others. So I was startled when Paul called and requested me to make another record for them. Will you produce it? He asked. If I'm truly authorized to produce it, I said, I won't do it if I have to go back and accept a bunch of directions I don't like. Martin reserved a block of time at Abbey Road Studios from July 1st through August after gaining assurance from McCartney that he would have a free hand. As a result, the stage was set for the Beatles' 10th studio album, named after the Labyrinth recording facility in North London's St. John's Wood that had served as the location for their most triumphant musical achievements. Though the Get Back Project's music, renamed Let It Be, would be released later in the spring of 1970, Abbey Road was the Beatles' final word, the final recordings by the decade's most successful and influential musicians. On the occasion of its 50th anniversary, Abbey Road has been expertly remixed by Giles Martin, George Martin's son and protege, and reissued in a super deluxe edition that includes an archive of studio outtakes and a 100-page book of essays and liner notes detailing how the recordings were made. The Beatles are good even if everyone already knows they're good. Classical composer Ned Roram observed in 1968, referring to how the band's enormous popularity confused conventional conceptions of discriminating taste. If anyone needs reminding, the new edition of Abbey Road should be enough. You can see how significant the Abbey Road album is to the Beatles. Do you like this album? Let us know in the comments. By the late 1960s, the artistic foundation of the Beatles' dominance in the world of popular music was clear to everybody. Here was a band that included two of the greatest pop singers and songwriters of their generation, was overseen by a supremely innovative pop record producer, and was backed up by a pair of highly competent and resourceful instrumentalists, one of whom, George Harrison, was emerging as a gifted songwriter in his own right. The partnership between John Lennon and Paul McCartney was the axis of the group's genius. For more than 10 years, their musical friendship had been the most important relationship in each of their lives. But that all changed in the spring of 1968, when Lennon returned to London from the Maharashi Ashram in Rishikesh, divorced, and immersed himself into a sexual and artistic engagement with Yoko Ono, the fame-obsessed Japanese performance artist. The latter had been chasing him for more than a year. Later, the press and public would blame Ono for the Beatles' demise. Still, she was more like the solvent that Lennon used to destroy the links of unity and the common purpose that had defined popular music's most illustrious band of brothers. Ono displaced McCartney as Lennon's partner, inspiration, and sounding board from when the two moved in together in June 1968. It didn't worry Lennon that she understood nothing about singing, composition, or music production. If anything, Ono's brand of dilettantism was a fantastic tonic for a recognized musical artist whose concerns about art-making pretensions had lately driven him to assert to the Beatles' authorized biographer, Hunter Davies, that Beethoven is a scam, just like we are now. McCartney reacted to the arrival of Ono with all the persuasive musical powers at his disposal. The many months of rehearsals and recording that went into making the White Album had resulted in a noticeable improvement in the Beatles' ensemble performance. McCartney's Get Back concept began as an attempt to revive the band's sense of personal and musical togetherness by restoring it to its beginnings as a performing band. Several of the tunes McCartney revealed during those sessions were meant to urge Lennon to share lead vocals with him. 
two of us was self-explanatory. While I've got a feeling, reverse the structure of A Day in the Life by incorporating McCartney's verses alongside Lennon's release. McCartney threw himself into a session in April when Lennon sought to celebrate his recent marriage to Ono by Rush recording The Ballad of John and Yoko. At a time when George Harrison and Ringo Starr were otherwise engaged, making up the absence of the others by playing bass, drums, piano, percussion, and singing harmony on the track. When Harrison and Starr returned a few days later, it signaled the beginning of a fruitful series of sessions in which all four Beatles introduced new songs. However, any hopes that this renewed spirit of collaboration would carry over into the band's next album were dashed when Lennon and McCartney clashed over whether the group's financial management should be entrusted to McCartney's new in-laws, entertainment lawyers Lee and John Eastman, or to Lennon and Ono's proxy, music business fixer Alan Klein. In their efforts to outdo one another, Klein and the Eastmans missed the opportunity for the Beatles to obtain control of both their management and music publishing organizations, forcing EMI to deposit their record royalties into escrow until the courts could settle the matter. For the first time in a long time, the world's most successful rock band got together to record an album because they needed the cash to pay their bills. Despite this need, McCartney was the only Beatle that arrived at Abbey Road at the start of the July sessions. He spent the day perfecting his vocals on You Never Give Me Your Money, which summed up his feelings towards Klein. Lennon was approximately 400 miles away at the time, on a road trip with Ono and their respective young children in Scotland, where he had flipped their car into a ditch the day before. The children were only scared, but Lennon sustained a gash on his head and had to be hospitalized, as did Ono. The following day, Harrison and Starr joined McCartney in the studio. For the next three weeks while Lennon recovered, the surviving three Beatles worked happily on songs written by McCartney and Harrison. When Lennon arrived at Abbey Road with a new song with the somewhat satirical title Come Together, he was followed by a staff of attendants who set up a double bed for Ono in the main studio. While this was still sinking in, Lennon made it obvious that McCartney was not speaking for him when he informed George Martin that the Beatles were happy to follow the directions of their producer as they had in the past. When Lennon learned of Martin's desire to expand on the unified concept of Sgt. Pepper by musically and thematically linking the tracks to give the new album a symphonic form, he responded with his organizing principle, all of his songs on one side of the record, all of McCartney's songs on the other. As usual, it was up to McCartney to mediate a solution. Drawing on the band's previous successes, he proposed that one side of the album, like Revolver, comprised of songs by the Beatles, most of which date from the earlier April sessions, each with its distinct lead singer. Like Sgt. Pepper, the flip side would be an interconnected melody of newly recorded tunes. On this basis, the Beatles pressed ahead in the weeks following Lennon's return, with a record that they had hoped, with a record that they must have hoped, feared, or otherwise guessed may be their final as a group. The term sides refers to the fact that Abbey Road, like most Beatles albums, was first issued as a double-sided vinyl LP. This was the model that had transformed the music industry in the 1960s, when the group's success, self-sufficiency, and rising artistic ambition helped to establish the self-written album as the primary medium of rock. When long-playing records first became available in the 1950s, their capacity was their selling feature. LPs, unlike the 78 RPM records they replaced, could store more than 20 minutes of music per side, making them an excellent format for the lengthy performances of classical music, Broadway plays, film soundtracks, modern jazz, and stand-up comedy that dominated the record industry at the time. All of this, of course, is antiquated in a day of digital streaming and shuffling, which threatens the fundamental concept of a record album as a unified piece of art. In this regard, the 50th anniversary reissue of Abbey Road is an anachronism, a return to a time when the LP cover could function as a cultural icon and the order of the songs on an album's two sides were imprinted on the memories of its listeners. In the pantheon of Beatles album covers, Abbey Road ranks with the ensemblage of cultural icons on the front of Sgt. Pepper and the enigmatic side-lit picture of the group's debut capital LP. But, like so much else on the album, the cover was a compromise. After considering titling the album Everest after traveling to Nepal to be photographed in front of the world's tallest mountain, the Beatles simply walked out the studio door on an August afternoon. The iconic photograph of the four of them standing purposefully across the now-famous zebra crossing, Lennon and White, Starr in black, McCartney in gray, and Harrison in hippie denim from head to toe, 
emphasized the differences in a band that had first captured the world's attention in matching suits and haircuts. However, its iconic significance was due to the way it came to serve as a characteristically sardonic image of the Beatles walking off the stage of their career as a group in retrospect. So that's it guys, it's been an incredible trip for our Liverpool boys, and it can't get any better than this. We'd like you to tell us how important this voyage was to you and who your favorite Beatle is from the band. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, give this video a big thumbs up, and share it with the Beatles lovers around. I hope to see you in the next one.